Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, a good sign. Florida's governor takes action on a measure to protect the unborn. The president abroad. As Joe Biden continues his trip to Ireland, we hear from a pro-life lawmaker there defending the faith. A Catholic priest in England tells us about his recent victory over the National Health Service and a saving grace. Learn more about Divine Mercy Sunday taking place this weekend. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the U.S. Supreme Court is temporarily keeping in place federal rules for the use of the abortion drug Mifepristone. The Biden administration urged the Supreme Court just today to preserve access to the pill free from restrictions. Those restrictions included how it's prescribed and dispensed. For now, the high court is asking both sides in that case to weigh in as it more fully considers the issues being raised. Meanwhile, pro-life groups argue that Mifepristone has killed millions of babies over the last two decades and has harmed women as well. Meanwhile, in Florida last night, Governor Ron DeSantis signed the Heartbeat Protection Act into law, banning abortions once an unborn baby's heartbeat is detected at six weeks. And while pro-lifers are praising the move, the White House is expressing outrage. White House correspondent Owen Jensen has more. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight, the White House is especially upset because Florida has become a destination state for women seeking an abortion who live in nearby states where it's already been banned. And for pro-life groups, this is another reason for hope. Governor Ron DeSantis signing Florida's newest pro-life law. He says it expands pro-life protections and provides additional resources for young mothers and families. His office adds, while other states like California and New York have legalized infanticide up until birth, Governor DeSantis has enacted historic measures to defend the dignity of human life and transform Florida into a pro-family state. And today he spoke to students during convocation at Liberty University in Virginia. When common sense suddenly became an uncommon virtue, Florida stood as a refuge of sanity, a citadel of freedom for people throughout our country and indeed throughout the world. White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre attacked the pro-life bill. Her statement calls it an extreme and dangerous new abortion ban, adding the ban flies in the face of fundamental freedoms and is out of step with the views of the vast majority of the people of Florida and of all the United States. And during a trip to New York, Vice President Kamala Harris told a civil rights organization. And just yesterday in Florida, extremists there signed a six-week ban before most women even know they're pregnant. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden travels across Ireland visiting County Mayo, including a stop at the Sanctuary of Our Lady Knock, where he took a tour with the parish priest, Father Richard Gibbons. The Knock Shrine is an international Eucharistic and Marian shrine, a place of pilgrimage. Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, and Pope Francis have all visited. Now, the pilgrimage site is where, in August of 1879, Mother Mary, St. Joseph, and St. John the Evangelist all appeared along a stone wall. Also, President Biden will be flying back from Ireland tonight, and he's scheduled to spend the weekend at Rehoboth Beach in Delaware. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, earlier, we spoke with a pro-life member of Parliament in Ireland. He weighed in on how the country is receiving President Biden and why the faithful have some questions, too. Joining us now from Ireland is Senator Ronan Mullen. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. So curious, um, how has President Biden's trip gone so far from your perspective? And what has the coverage been like? How has he been received there? I think this has been a highly successful visit for President Biden. Uh, Irish people are delighted to be getting such attention from the President of the United States. He's been there, here for, for three days. And there's recognition that politicians on all sides in the U.S., Republicans and Democrats, have been great supporters of our Northern Ireland uh, peace agreement over the years. And, of course, it's the 25th anniversary of that Good Friday agreement that's the primary reason why he's here. So it's been a, a tick or tape, tape welcome for him. It, it also, of course, 
plays very well, that he stresses his Irish roots. Um, in fact, he's stressing his Irish Catholicism in a particular way. Uh, he's going to be speaking in front of uh, St. Muradach's Cathedral in Ballina tonight, with the cathedral in the background, making a, a private visit to, to Knock Shrine, our Marian Shrine in County Mayo in the west of Ireland. Um, you, needless to say, the media have been pretty uncritical. No uh, contradictions in any of that have been explored with the president. The shopkeepers are happy. The restaurateurs are happy. The hotel are happy. They're all hoping to see more of you as a result of this visit. And to be honest with you, from that point of view, from the point of view of promoting Ireland and strengthening the Good Friday Agreement, this has certainly been very good on all sides. Senator Mullen, I, I, I want to talk about the Good Friday Agreement. Before I get to that, though, I, I want to talk about President Biden's Catholic faith. I mean, you brought this up. Um, let's talk about, you know, what that played in his trip. And also, what's your response uh, to his highlighting his Catholic faith on this trip in particular? Well, to be honest with you, he's really gone in hard on this, a stressing concept of human dignity, the reminder of his parents to keep the faith, the visit to our Marian shrine, as I said, speaking with the cathedral in the background. There's obviously an electioneering side of this. It's not just the politician in me saying this, you know, in terms of uh, what his intentions are in terms of 2024. Um, the media don't, in Ireland, don't really want to explore that because, in a sense, they like a model of Catholic identity that's comfortable with aggressive pro-abortion policy, which would, I think, be the hallmark of the Biden administration. There haven't been any questions about the, the you know, the blind eye being turned to the, I think it's now 80 pro-life pregnancy care centers being attacked on your side of the Atlantic, uh, the pushing of abortion in connection with international development aid. I'm afraid we haven't had any of those questions, to be honest with you. It, it, there's been a uniform positive response. People either preferring to, to lay the stress on the positive, the Good Friday Agreement, the president's Irish roots are perhaps those with a more liberal political agenda liking it that way, that you have somebody here kind of modeling Catholicism without the challenging bits about respect for life, etc. Yeah. And of course, obviously, you're a pro-life lawmaker, you're Catholic, you're in Ireland right now. Um, you know, what is the state of the church in Ireland and also the pro-life movement? Where are you right now in Ireland? Well, in some ways, you see the resilience of the Catholic Church here, the desire of the president to associate himself, to wrap itself in that mantle, and, and, and people here are very happy with that aspect of the expression of Catholic identity. I suppose you could say the church is institutionally weak as well. It would have been impossible, I think, really, for any churchman here this week to in any way signal discomfort about the administration's policies on issues like abortion. So I suppose the more pragmatic approach is to say, look, every pilgrim is welcome. And, and, and to be honored, which we should be, by a visit from the President of the United States. The pro-life movement, of course, is still recovering from the loss of our pro-life amendment uh, in 2018. People take great hope, of course, from the decision in the Dobbs case on your side. We all recognize, of course, that the challenge now is to find pro-life laws and adjustments that can endure. This is not going to be an overnight win for us. It's something that we all have to work to find laws that people can support and that gradually increase people's awareness again of the sanctity of every human life, a mother and baby. And I'm glad to say that there are many young people in Ireland, not a majority, but many young people who are very energized around the pro-life cause and who are determined to build a better future, just like you have in America. Senator Mellon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate it. God bless you. Well, on Capitol Hill, federal spending and raising the debt ceiling will be front and center next week when Congress returns. House Republicans remain unified over agreement to raising the debt limit, but only if there are also budget cuts. Democrats warned that strategy could lead the country into default. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has that story. There has been little movement to bring House Republicans and the White House closer to a deal, and the clock is ticking. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the country could default by the end of summer, but right now she claims the economy is strong. I'm not anticipating a downturn in the economy, although, um, of course, that remains a risk. That risk, she says, is linked to Congress raising the debt limit. The House Freedom Caucus backs Speaker Kevin McCarthy's demands for spending cuts as part of a deal. And we're uh, really um, gratified to see the Speaker um, send a strong message to the President of the United States that it will be the President who chooses to gamble with the uh, possibility of default, not 
the United States House of Representatives. Some Senate Republicans are also on board. So to just, in a very blasé manner, raise the debt ceiling without addressing uh, our imbalances and the unsustainable place we're taking this nation with regard to our debt is extremely irresponsible. And there's another issue. House Republicans haven't released a budget yet, something Congresswoman Nancy May says is tied to the debt limit. I want to see us look at inflation and supply chain issues, but look at it in a way that can make a difference, because right now most of what we've done cannot pass the Senate. But what does that look like? Reports say the GOP budget could include rolling back federal spending levels to 2022, a cut of more than $130 billion. It also includes work requirements for millions on Medicaid and food stamps. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer mocked that idea in a tweet, quote, Republicans just keep saying out loud that they want to cut Medicaid, that they want to cut food assistance for kids. Maybe that's why they still haven't shown the American people their plan. Democrats are standing up for people and families. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is expected to brief the GOP caucus next week on the Republicans' budget framework. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN, News Nightly. Well, the Arizona Supreme Court upholds a law saying religious officials do not need to report child sexual abuse claims that they learn about in a confessional setting. The case in question deals with misconduct charges against leaders of the Mormon Church. All the man accused of firebombing a pro-life pregnancy center in Wisconsin has pleaded not guilty. Investigators believe the man threw two Molotov cocktails into Wisconsin Family Action last May, causing extensive damage. Prosecutors say when the man was arrested last month, he was at Logan Airport in Boston with a one-way ticket out of the country. No word as to when he'll return to Wisconsin to face trial. Oh, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including defending the faith. We talked to a Catholic priest who sued the UK's National Health Service and won. And learn more about Divine Mercy Sunday, which we celebrate this weekend. Thanks for staying with us. An oligarch from Moldova has been sentenced to 15 years in prison. Officials say the man played a leading role in the theft of $1 billion from a bank. The man was sentenced even though his current whereabouts are unknown. Well, officials in China say that they will not sell weapons to any party involved in the war in Ukraine. Beijing's foreign ministry assures U.S. authorities that the country will remain neutral in the conflict while only backing Russia politically. Meanwhile, Chinese and Taiwan relations grow unstable after large-scale military drills were conducted to intimidate Taipei. Two Catholic Relief Services workers were shot and killed on Easter Sunday in Ethiopia. They were riding a company vehicle when the murders took place. Reuters is reporting the killings occurred during a violent anti-government protest. The Catholic aid organization is expressing its deepest sympathy to the families. A Catholic priest who served as a chaplain in a hospital in London recently won a settlement with the United Kingdom's National Health Service. Father Patrick Policino says while serving in a hospital, he was fired for expressing the church's teaching on homosexuality. The Malteborn priest, who was once a professor of neuroscience, sued for harassment and religious discrimination. In his settlement, he was awarded around $12,000. And Father Patrick Policino joins us now. Father, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, first off, what was your reaction to winning the settlement? I was very happy in the end because I didn't really want to go through a whole court case. And um, it, it, uh, it, it ended quite, quite quickly. But what I did ask for was to be reinstated and also that they would have a Catholic chaplain there all the time, because there always was one. But they refused those two things. They refused to reinstate me, and they refused to have a Catholic chaplain. And Father, take us you know, through exactly what happened. Yeah, I, I hadn't been chaplain there for very long. Well, I hadn't been ordained for long, but it was around about the time I was ordained. And then I was I made part-time chaplain, and they said, oh, there's a Catholic patient in such and such a ward who wants to see a Catholic chaplain. I said, fine, get out and see him. So 
he said, can I come out, go out, can we go outside for a walk and I want to talk to you? I said, sure, but I asked one of the staff to accompany us. And then, you know, we sat down on the grass and started to chat. And he, uh, you know, he said he was, he had a male partner and he wanted to marry him. And he asked what, if I would support this, if I would meet him, and what, you know, what, what I would, basically, if, if I would, um, you know, bless this, not in terms of blessing, but if, if I would agree to it. And so I said to him, well, you know, I wanted to him to think through it himself. So I said, what do you think God would say about this? You know, being a Catholic, he should know that. And I was quite surprised he asked me this question because, you know, he he um, he would have known the answer to it. I would have expected a more subtle question about issues related to it. But so, and that's that's all. You know, then he didn't respond after that. To he didn't ask further. But then he did say that um, his he was in a poor, his, his father was upset with him because of his lifestyle. And so I said to him, well, you know, maybe in that situation I would be too. Father, we are just about out of time. Quickly though, I'm wondering, um, you know, what do you think this all signals? And how do you think we as Catholics, as a faithful, um, should respond to situations like this? Yeah, well, I think number one, it shows that we've got a group that is willing to uh, willing to be aggressive, and they the in initially they they let's compromise, but once they have power, they will just be very aggressive. So if we we have to appreciate that our Catholicism is under attack. It's not, you know, it may be hidden for a while, but they're going to try and get rid of Catholicism because of the rules we have. So one thing people have to know that that's our religion is under threat. But secondly, I think this shows that if you, we have to not be meek all the time. I know time for meekness there is, but when our religion is being attacked, that's not, we should not be meek. We should be going to the law and I was very, I was very comforted by the fact that, having gone to the law, having ta having taken legal steps, that it caused them to to backtrack quite quickly. So I think we should all be doing this. If anybody confronts you in any way like this, I think you should just go to the law and ask, ask for ask for support, because I'm sure there are legal entities in the states which who would support you in this. And I think if this starts to happen all over the country, then we we will. We will stop the advance and people realize that they cannot, you know, take Catholics for granted. Yeah. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about all of this. Congratulations again um, on winning You're your welcome. lawsuit. God bless you. Father Apologino says his offer to work for free was denied by the hospital. He also says the medical center still employs four chaplains to Anglican, a Lutheran and a Muslim. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a giant devotion. The faithful in Mexico have dedicated the largest statue in the country to our Lord. Plus, Divine Mercy. Learn more about this important feast day coming up. Officials in Mexico recently dedicated a sculpture of Jesus, and it is the largest statue in the entire country. The Christ of Peace statue is located in Zacatecas, Mexico. It stands in the center of the Esplanade atop Faith and Religion Hill. Thousands of faithful were present for the dedication on Easter Sunday. One local priest says that he hopes the likeness brings faith 
and hope the 108-foot-tall sculpture took more than two years to complete. All this Sunday is Divine Mercy Sunday, a relatively new feast in the Universal Church calendar. It was brought into the calendar in the year 2000 at the canonization of St. Faustina. The Vatican says the day is an invitation to the Christian world to turn with confidence toward the trials and difficulties we are facing now and in the future. And it also includes a special grace. We go now to Father Chris Aylar, Director of the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Father Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, first off, thank let's you. talk a little bit more about Divine Mercy Sunday, how it came to be, and why it's so important. Well, Jesus told St. Faustina, which uh, you may have heard of as a nun in the 1930s, that mankind's last hope of salvation was divine mercy. And he said, if we don't pass through the doors of his mercy, we must pass through the doors of his justice. I don't think anybody wants to do that. So mercy, although it's not new, um, we saw God's mercy right in the garden after the fall of Adam and Eve with the promise of a savior and the gift of a mother. While it's not new in terms of the message of divine mercy, the devotion is new given to St. Faustina. And we have five elements of that devotion. We have the Feast of Divine Mercy, the Image, the Novena, the Chaplet, and the Hour of Divine Mercy, which is 3 o'clock. But this Sunday, we celebrate the first one, Feast. And that's a huge day of grace that Jesus offers. On this one day, he says the floodgates of mercy are open, and we can receive a promise of all the forgiveness of sins, but not just forgiveness of sins, all the punishment that we are due as a consequence of our sins is also wiped away. So as we say, it's like a second baptism, an amazing day. Yeah, it absolutely is. Father Chris, talk to us about the messages um, that St. Faustina received from Jesus and how they're still relevant today. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina that she would help prepare the world for his final coming, and that was 92 years ago. So God has been given us um, so much opportunity to get right with him, to become um, virtuous in our living, to be in a state of grace. And he's giving us all these tools to help us, such as the, the novena, the chaplet, the image. And again, this feast on um, coming up this Sunday is, is part of that. That promise and that feast and these messages are all relevant today. Why? Because the Bible tells us that where sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. We are in a time of unprecedented sin, and the sin now has reached levels that mankind has never seen before. And so what is God's answer? He gives us even more mercy. But we got to be careful because God says, take advantage of this mercy now while there's time, because after does come the time of justice. And Father Chris, um, let's talk about what will be taking place uh, on Sunday at the Shrine. What can we expect, and is anything going to be different from these celebrations? Yeah, we're oh, yes, we're excited because it's been four years uh, that we have been unable to have a live broadcast here on EWTN due to the COVID restrictions of our local authorities. Praise be to God this year, um, we're able to return to the full life broadcast. So if you're near in the Northeast um, or close by to major cities, you can come here uh, a full day of adoration, um, confessions throughout the whole uh, Saturday and Sunday, and most of all, the mass that allows you to receive this grace. Because remember, Jesus said the only two requirements for this grace are to get to confession and to receive Holy Communion. That is the all, that is the only request our Lord asks of us. And of course, to have a, uh, reckon, you know, a rectified will that we want to do well, we want to give up our sins. But when we get to confession and go to communion, he promises this grace of forgiveness of sin and punishment. So come here, uh, and if you're not able to visit in person, you can watch us on EWTN starting at noon Eastern time and um, make your act of contrition. If you can't make it to confession, make your communion, your spiritual communion. If you can't get to Holy Communion and ask God for this amazing grace. We have about 30 seconds left or so. Um, but Father Chris, any final thoughts and any messages maybe do you have for folks? 
Yeah, please. Um, you know, our Lord, uh, many of us Marian fathers and priests that are based here in the Marian community and, and throughout the world have been begging our Lord to allow us to have one more Divine Mercy Sunday. We never know when our Lord may come again. Um, I know when nobody knows the day, the time, or the hour, but take advantage of this grace today because we never know when it might be the last Divine Mercy Sunday. Absolutely. Father Chris, thank you so much for talking to us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for all that you do. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. And just a reminder, as Father Chris had mentioned, you can follow Divine Mercy Sunday right here on EWTN. It starts Sunday at noon with a preview show from the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, followed by a mass at 1.30 p.m. Oh, we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night, and God bless.